spiritual realm. We, we, we look different. There, there are things that, that are going on. <clears throat> and that's, a, that's an illustration of, of what's happening and why we need to stand together collectively as a church. Stand together collectively as a family. Right? We talked about everybody standing together really strong and holding our shields. But if somebody is messing around and stealing from each other or gossiping, they, they slowly move away and all of a sudden there's a big gap and, and the enemy just jumps right inside there. And so if we're a family, if we're a husband and a wife and we have our shields linked up together protecting our family and we're not doing well and like I say bad things and I speak death to my wife and all these things, there's a, there's a gap now that takes place. And then bad things happen and we make bad choices, a bigger gap takes place. And the enemy just walks in and out of our homes and does whatever they want to do in our, in our families. And so we need to be mindful of that, to understand that, to learn how to combat that, and to learn about living the, a life of righteousness according to God's word because we are standing for so much more than we know. All right? So that kind of gets us started. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much. That you would teach us, and train us, and mentor us, Lord, in, in this area, Father. And uh, we're not trying to be entertaining to talk about uh, weird things or funny things, Lord. But we're just trying to hear you, Lord, to speak to our hearts about living lives that are victorious. Father, you have called us, especially this generation, Lord, to lead and to show people the way home. Father, we know that time is running short and that you are going to be returning sometime soon. And so we want to be able to stand collectively together. And there are so many children that you love who are lost. And you would use us to bring them into your kingdom. So Father, please speak to us uh, this morning. And uh, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Please, all of you and none of me. I praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just came back from Oahu. I was, I was on Oahu for a week's time. We had a pastoral um, uh, conference on, on Oahu. So... All these pastors from all over the world get together, and Pastor Wayne takes us through all this training, and he teaches us about uh, about leading well and, and shepherding well and taking care of, of you folks, etc. And uh, one of the things that we did is uh, we went we, we work out. The pastors they encourage the pastors to really work out, and I actually I started this two week program uh, two weeks ago, and I'm supposed to like work out every day, and then I'm supposed to like document everything that I'm doing, like how many calories in, how many calories out, and uh, I haven't done anything yet about that, <laughs> and so I'm hoping my coach doesn't fire me, <laughs> you know, I have a, like, a, like a trainer, and um, so anyway, there's a lot of workout things that, that, that I'm doing that I don't usually do, so there's like stretching and a lot of cardio, etc., and so the pastors, we, we go hiking and we do things, we play volleyball, and, uh, and, and we're just training, and it reminds me this one time when I was, um, I usually lift weights. That's the kind of workouts that I prefer to do. But like when we're working out, just doing cardio, etc., I would go to the gym, 24-hour fitness, and I went to this yoga class. And at this yoga class, uh, the, the, the teacher would say, you know, do this pose like this. And so I said, oh, yeah, I can do that. Do this pose like that. Said, oh, okay, I can do that. Do this. And all these different things like that, right? And then, and then she said, um, just to stretch out your spine and lean forward and you know and it's a really kind of sophisticated looking bunch of people it's kind of like between 45 and 55 years of age and they say that any age is 50 right so everybody's like they're fit and they have abs and they have like grandkids and they're like they have their life together or whatever and so they're just very sophisticated nice nice group of people and so i'm over there and, and she said okay like stretch out your arms and like lean forward and i'm like oh, okay and i'm leaning forward and out of nowhere, this bubble in my stomach comes out, and there's just a <laughs> right. And and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, oh no! And then I'm hoping, oh, I hope nobody heard. But it, it's, it's clear, you know, the cat was out, and it was, it was, it was quite the, the ordeal. And uh, I choose actually not to do stuff like that as much as I can. And. Um, of course, obviously uh, em embarrassing, but one of the things that I remember in that yoga class, and, and I'm not sure how, how you feel about yoga. A lot of people are like, you know, it's like worship to all these sun, uh, all these like Hindu gods, etc. But as a born again believer, 
we, you know, we can go to something and just, you know, I'm always thinking about Jesus. I'm always praising the Lord and whatever people are saying. And then we can redeem things for the purposes of, of God's um, growing God's kingdom. But one thing that I remember this, uh, this instructor saying was to clear your mind. Okay, so this is what they say when you, when you go, to, when you go to, uh, to a yoga class, I guess. As they say, clear your mind. Everything that's inside of your mind that's bothering you, all the junk that's inside of your mind, clear it out. So it's just like you have a glass of, of, of water. Let's say your, your head is like filled with like something, whatever it is. What they say is to pour it out. So all the junk goes out. So we're going to clear your mind, and we just start to like, do things, right? And it's like, oh, it feels so good because I don't have any worries in the world. I'm just stretching. My body feels good, etc. And that's that's what's called a, a form of meditation in the Eastern cultures. Okay, so their form of meditation is to clear your mind, which means just to dump out all the junk that's inside of your mind. Uh, we read in Ephesians 4:17, and I'm reading out of King, the King James version for this, <clears throat> and it says. This I, say there, there, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The word uh, vanity there in, in, uh, in Ephesians 4.17, it's, it's, it's in here, the vanity of their mind. What that means is in the emptiness of your mind, in the absence of your mind. When there's nothing there, when there's nothing happening inside of your mind, that's where things start to go wrong. That's where things start to go wrong. And in verse 18, it says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. And so first of all, vanity, or having that vanity of mind means that there's nothing happening between our ears. It's just blank. It's just empty. And on top of that, then our understanding, understanding of who we are, understanding of who God made us to be, understanding how much we're cherished and loved and precious, etc. It's not there because there's a vanity of mind because we just dumped it all out. And so not knowing God's power that's inside of us is going to play a big role in how victorious we are and living a life for the Lord, because he's called us to be victors. He's called us to fight the good fight. And the thing is, we don't actually even fight for victory. When we understand God's word, we understand that we're fighting from victory, which means that God has already won. We already read the ending of the story. We know the authority that we have, so we fight from victory. And when we understand that, we stand strong and we walk victoriously. If we don't know that, or if there's a vanity of our mind, then all of a sudden we, we don't know who we are and then we're not sure who we are and then we start to fall apart, all right? <clears throat> and on top of that, it also tells us in verse 18, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. So it doesn't mean that, that we're stupid, it just means that we're ignorant, that we just don't know. And what it does is it starts to separate us from the Lord just a little bit and a little bit. So what the Word of God is telling us is that we cannot have this vanity of mind, which means we cannot have this emptiness of mind. We cannot just be like mindless to things. We have to have a focus. We have to know what we're thinking about. We have to know why we're thinking these things. Because we know that what you think is what you say. And what you say is what you do. And what you do is who you are. So very important that our minds are calibrated to something that we know what we're thinking about, we know why we're thinking such things, and then we move forward, all right? <clears throat> so moving on, in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians, two. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. This is what it says. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For what? For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Cool. Okay, so again, in God's word, he's telling us that it's not a physical fight. 
if we are born again and you love the Lord and you raise your hand and say, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and now we're born again, you are, you've entered into a fight. So whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, we are all in a spiritual battle. It's not against flesh and blood, which means that the issues that we have with our spouse, or maybe you're going through a circumstance with somebody at work, or somebody, maybe it's our children, whatever it is, if you're going through differences with a person, it's never the person. It's a spiritual issue. That there are spiritual things behind, behind us, maybe, or behind them, that are just pulling strings, and it's making everything go sideways. So it's so important to understand that because we, we go through marriage counseling all the time and we hear people say, you know, if my husband just started doing this, and if he just started going to Bible study, if he started just be the man of God that he's supposed to be, and all these kind of things, but wrong, we're, we're looking at all the wrong things. It's, he's not the, the knucklehead. There's, there's a spiritual aspect that needs to be adjusted and corrected. Because the moment we understand spirituality correctly, understand who we are and what God says about us, and operate in that and walk towards the Lord, we will become a better husband or a better spouse just by loving the Lord and understanding who we are in Him. So it's never, I'm pretty sure we're kind of clear on that already, it's never, it's never against people. It's never against people. It's always a spiritual thing. And it's so important because if you're going through um, relationship issues, we need to know that we don't hate the person. We actually love the person and we love the potential within them. It's just a spiritual issue that we need to kind of take care of. And if we don't see that, and we just see them with these eyes of anger and hate, then unfortunately we look at other people and we see the eyes of anger and unforgiveness for them too, and then um, for them too. And then we realize we have spiritual issues that we need to take care of. Amen? So, from the very beginning, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3-5, we understand that it's not uh, against uh, flesh and blood, just like we read in uh, Ephesians earlier. Um, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, are not physical, are not things that we can see, hear, taste, smell, or feel, but mighty in God. For what? For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is a stronghold? What's a stronghold? So if somebody said, hey, um, what's a stronghold? You're a Christian, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You go to church, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You read the Bible, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's a stronghold? Oh, uh, you know, well, uh, I don't know. Or what does it mean to what does it mean to um, cast out arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? What does that What does that mean? To exalt um, to exalt thoughts against the, the knowledge of God. Originally, you know, when I used to read this myself, I thought it meant anything that goes against God, so anything that's like evil, or anything that's like like uh, anti-Christian, anything that's anti-Christ, that those are thoughts that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So any kind of religion, that you know, Satanism, Wicca, etc., anything that goes against the knowledge of God, that's what I thought it was, anything that goes against God's will. But that's not necessarily true. And the Lord spoke to me before, and He said, you... You have strongholds and thoughts that are contrary to me and to my knowledge. And I said, what? No, I don't. And he said, yes, you do. And this is something that the Lord revealed to me. And um, we'll, go, we'll go into how it became a stronghold. And we'll explain that in just a second. But any thoughts um, that are, are contrary to God's, to the knowledge of God are things like this. If God says to you, if God says to you, what do you know about me in regard to healing? So, well, God, according to your word, according to the Bible, your word says that you are the God who heals, and you heal all diseases. And God says that, that that's right. And, and I say, okay, well, I, I understand that. Then the Lord says, then why do you always depend on what other people say but in regards to your health? Oh, because they're like doctors, and they went to school for like several years, and, and they, know, they know what's going on. And he says, but why do you put all your trust and your faith in what the doctors say? what the nurses say, what the tests say, what the disease is, and all these things. If you trust in that more than you trust in the Word of God, you are exalting yourself, you're exalting your thoughts against the knowledge of God. Because you know that God's Word is true, right? Yes, Lord, I know that it's true. You know that my Word says that by my stripes you are healed, right? Yeah, I, I, I do know that. So why all the attention and all the faith on what doctors everybody else says 
oh, I don't know. That's what it means to have thoughts that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Other things are things like provision. You know, I hear Christians, I have a Christian friend who said this recently. He said, oh, we want to have more kids, but we can't, or we won't, because we can't afford them. And I said, what? He said, yeah, it's, man, it's so expensive. You know, living here in Maui, it's so expensive. You know, we can't have kids. And I said, no. And that's another example of our thoughts exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. God says, what do you know about me in regard to provision? Well, you are the God who provides all things according to the riches of your glory. We just read that in scripture. And you are the God who provides all my needs. He says, that's true. So why do you put all your faith in your employer, whether the person is going to hire you or not, whether you have got enough money to do this or buy that or to have children, etc. Why do you put all your trust and your faith in such things and not in God's word and not in God's character? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. There you go. Those are thoughts that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And so when we understand that as Christians, so we're not even talking about people who just don't even like the Bible or don't even like the Word of God. Even people like us, sometimes our thoughts exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And so we want to be mindful of that and know like, oh my goodness, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And then what a stronghold is, when we go through this, right, when we're believing other things more than we believe God, it starts to grip you. It's kind of like it'll start gripping you at your feet. And then all of a sudden, you can walk around. There's like a chain, right? And so you walk around and you can do something. But the more and more you exalt your thoughts against, against the knowledge of God, it starts to grip you more, grip you more, and then you're standing in like this little thing of concrete. Then you can't even, then you can't even, you can't even move. Because now there's a stronghold upon you because you thought so much and you trust so much in everything else except for what God says that now there's a stronghold that's come upon you. And now we just don't, well, I don't, I don't know, I can't pray for you because like, you know, even my pastor prayed and he died. So if he prayed and he died, you know, what, what luck am I going to have? There's a loss of faith. And we, we remember last week when we had the shield of faith, shield of faith, and just kind of because of circumstances, we give up that shield of faith. And it's like, forget it then. I don't even want to do this anymore. And now there's a big gap right there for the enemy just to walk in and out of your camp because of our, our faith that we just give up. We give up our faith because of these strongholds that we have, that we instill on ourselves because we exalt our thoughts against the knowledge of God. Isn't that interesting? So the enemy doesn't even, he doesn't have any other tricks except to deceive us. He cannot just walk up to you and just start murdering us. He, we have too much authority and too much power. But what he does is he throws up this big deception. And then we start to put ourselves in these strongholds. We start to say things and we know that death and life are in the power of the tongue. He that loves it shall eat the fruit thereof. We start to say things that we're never going to get that job. We're never going to be free of death. We're never going to be all these things. And as you release those words, there's power to that. And it comes to pass. Versus, yeah, I think according to God's word, we will get through this. My marriage will be healed. My whatever. And you just start professing it and saying those things. And God made us in his image. I mean, God created things. He didn't use his hands. He used his words. He used his mouth. And uh, we'll, we'll go into a series um, in the future entitled uh, The Power of Faith-Filled Words. But for now, that, that, that's, that, that should be sufficient for us to understand what strongholds are and what it means to exalt, have thoughts that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And every, so every high thing that exalts itself against God. And we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to do that. So that's why we're always encouraging you to read your word. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. There's so many Christians, and even pastors. Um, I'm not speaking bad on any pastors, but it, it's uh, just been brought to my attention that there are some pastors as well who just, you know, they're, they're so busy serving and, um, and preparing for messages and things like that. They, they don't take the time to just find their secret place and just spend time with the Lord and let the Lord just kind of work in their hearts. Because birth out of the time that we spend with the Lord is going to determine how we act and how we, how we are in our homes, with our wives and with our children, at work, whatever it is that you're doing. So we have to have that quiet time. That's why we encourage you folks to, to read your, your life journal, spend time with the Lord, and let the Lord mentor you. Coming to church on Sunday is great and it's wonderful, 
but you know, we always ask, how are you on Monday? How are you on Tuesday? Oh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, <laughs> come Friday, it was like, you know, we were running around, ah, we're gonna do whatever we wanna do. And so we're, the Lord is concerned with our, our person, our behind the scenes person. You know, how are we when nobody else can, can see us? Is that okay? You know, what if there was like a whole big, big group of people who are watching us when nobody else is watching us, or when we think nobody else is looking? Are you okay with that person? Just, just, just a question. By the way, there's a million thousand eyes, <laughs> thousand million eyes on you when, no, when you think nobody's looking. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a, there are people who are watching. It's the Lord. There are angels who are watching over us. So. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, moving on, moving on. It's so important that we, that we understand that Satan, he's a headhunter. He deceives us, and what he wants, his trophy, is going to be our imagination. Your imagination of the things that go on inside of your brain are so incredibly, uh, not only important, but powerful. The ideas that people have after they speak them forward and they, become, and they manifest, that's a part of us that we inherited from God. God put this imagination inside of us. In fact, he said, let us create man in our image, in our imagination. So before we were even born, he already seen how we were going to be. And he puts that kind of power inside of us. So the imaginations that we have are, are very important because whatever it is that we think are the things that we say. And whatever it is that we say are the things that we do. And whatever it is that we do are becomes the people that we are. So that being said, let me let me ask you let me ask you one, one question. I know it's gonna seem like it's kind of like far off, but in all of human history, of all the machines that were ever created, of all anything that was ever made, what is the most powerful machine that was ever created? Powerful machine. Was it a battleship? Was it a tank? Was it a super fast car? Was it an atomic bomb? Okay, I'm just gonna tell you. So it's none of those things, the most the most powerful machine ever created was the TV, the television, the television set. And the reason, the, reason why, the reason why we say this is because, first of all, many, in, in all cultures, or many cultures, they surround themselves around, in the living room is the TV, and everything else is kind of like surrounded.